Okay, today we have our friend Codeist here, a very experienced developer in the Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, also a very experienced developer uh, in overall general computing. Uh, someone that I know from the DBA and from the start we hit up really well. Uh, it was really a pleasure to meet him in there and also I could see him working. Uh, and he was easily, I guess, uh, among the best uh, of the of the class at that point. So, bro, I want to start with tell us a little bit of your backstory. Um, so maybe growing up, how you got interested in coding, and the things you used to do, and how you end up, you know, doing that for for a living. Yep. I don't know about the time, <laughs> uh, but yeah, how did I start? Uh, yeah, I come from India, by the way. So, you know, in India, it's like you, you do engineering first and then you figure out what you want to do. I kind of had a similar journey. I was very interested in computers. I was dabbling with a little bit of coding with C, C++. Uh, but not anything seriously. Um, and around 2013 is when I I started. Uh, actually, I started first uh, liking coding while studying electronics. Uh, I did engineering in electronics, and I was uh, writing assembly code for eight x86 uh, microprocessors. And at some point, I. Yeah, I found in India you 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 do whatever engineering you find a computer job, and yeah, I, I found this job uh, where I was uh, I was working for a very big telephone, uh, like a yeah, it's called Sprint. It's a telephone client. It's like big uh, telecommunication player. And I was building some, uh, it's called SIP. It's like a uh, phone module uh, for them uh, with Java and stuff. That's how I started. Uh, then I, at some point, I got a, like a scholarship kind of. So there was this Udacity who used to, who started uh, around that time and they, this is the time I'm still struggling with coding, and I am not a computer science student. I did electronics. I was interested in coding, but I was not like pro at all. I was, uh, yeah, I was just struggling. And uh, I got this scholarship with Udacity, uh, sponsored by Google for Android, and I started doing that. And that, that got me kicked into this industry more deeply. That led to uh some really good startups uh startup jobs where i worked for actually a really really big company in indonesia it's uh it's called gojek it's it's the heart of indonesia everything in indonesia is run on this company uh still web2 job all these web2 i was dabbling sometimes with bitcoin ethereum it didn't really click to me what it is but yeah i was looking because you know it was the hype it was cool I actually, I, I remember I did some smart contract programming in 2017, but yeah, it was just for fun. It didn't really click to me. Till, till fast forward 2020, I think, uh, doing web to job pretty, pretty, it, it was going pretty well. Uh, and, but also boring, you know, <laughs> uh, web to seems lot more boring now and then i was like let's let's see what's happening in blockchain now and i, I started reading a little bit and started looking at polkadot a little and i was so impressed by the governance in polkadot uh like yeah the way you can manage uh treasury votes uh people applying for uh making proposals, getting their treasury granted in milestones. Somehow it seemed so suddenly uh, 
much more organized and great. And that propelled me to learn more about Polkadot. Um, yeah, and yeah, then I was just doing here and there a little bit of reading and getting involved with communities. And then Polkadot Blockchain Academy happened. And yeah, since that's, then, you know. That's really interesting. Uh, what caught your eye about uh, Polkadot governance? What was the point in there? Uh, yeah, actually, it's very funny. So I I actually, first project I found out was, uh, I trying to remember what it was called, Joystream, yeah. It, it, Joystream is like a solo chain that is built with substrate. Um, and yeah, it's, it's trying to be YouTube, but, you know, decentralized. And... I just started looking at Joystream. I didn't even know it's built with substrate or anything. I, I was just looking at it and they seemed really, really polished. Their whole, you know, the uh, UI, the they have this on-chain forum where you discuss things, you do stuff. And like, if you have worked with Polkadot, you have this, uh, like Polka, Polka, what is it called? some website, I don't remember the name, where you go, uh, which uh, which is off-chain and it, ma it manages the treasury, uh, the forum. But for this choice team, they actually build the whole forum, the post that you're doing on-chain. And it felt amazing for a team of, I don't know, 10 or 15 people. And yeah, it got me really attracted to that project because I was like, how did they manage to build such a good tooling uh, with such a small team in such a short time. And yeah, looking at that, reading about them, trying to read their code, I realized they are built on something called Substrate. Interesting. Then that got me to Polkadot. And then I understood the Polkadot's governance. Yeah, it, it, it was somehow surreal for me looking at some case some use case which seems very realistic or uh how do i say it? uh something very practical you know i get it completely bro and one question that i that i have for you is a little bit different uh, a little bit off topic from what we're talking about now it's something that i've been through and you've been through too and i see a lot of people they want to do it but they don't know really how Especially some people in India, Brazil, which is moving out of their countries to work, let's say, in Europe or in the US, or maybe to live as a nomad, you know. What was the factor that made you do that when you got the offer, you know, to finally move out? Funny, it's their side to it. Before uh, I, I was actually fed up of my uh, regular life uh, of traffic and everything. You know, I mean, India is nice; it's amazing, but uh, it, sometimes it can exhaust too. And I, I wanted to go and see outside, live somewhere else for a while, and I had a job actually. And my plan was to go and to Bali <laughs> and freelance from there and at that point I got like a LinkedIn message uh, hey uh, do you wanna come to Stockholm and work for us <laughs> and I was like okay interesting of course uh, and I started giving interview for a company called Klarna um, and it happened very easily in, in some ways they were like yeah lot of you know rounds of interviews in big IT companies you know like I think I'm, I remember uh, six or seven rounds of interviews but they were pretty actually easy compared to the standard of interviews in India for you know good companies of course um, and I didn't know that so now looking back actually I think in Europe the competition, the uh, like, it's much easier to crack interviews in Europe than in India, 
for the same standard of companies. And in Europe, you know, you must know, like, in Europe, we always have, like, a shortage of engineers in India. You have too many engineers. It's highly competitive environment. So I don't know. Just just go out there. Find. Just try. Uh, jobs, you know, like LinkedIn, wherever. See companies who sponsor Visa and just apply to them. Or, yeah, find someone who can refer you. That, yeah, that would be even I do agree with you. You know, uh, the point about the the whole interview thing. I remember my my case, right, about moving out of my country and everything. I just wanted to do the best software possible, so I covered everything with tests and you know did it you know as perfectly as I could do. What I saw in Europe and it's quite interesting is that you know uh, the hiring process could be a little bit simpler, but what you find inside the companies is much higher level. So everything's highly, at least where I work, you know, everything was highly test. Everybody was up to the documentation, updated. So I encountered a much more mature environment than in Brazil. You know, you have any views about that? Yeah, I think that is true, uh, mostly. <laughs> Though, I mean, I've worked in India where, you know, we didn't take testing seriously or yeah the coding quality overall was not so good but then i mean there is this top bracket of companies uh in india i work for a company called thoughtworks uh, which is actually not indian company it's, it's like a very multinational company and i mean in some ways those were like that was one of the best companies i've worked with and the standard and quality of coding and people were actually much higher than companies I worked with uh, before Parity. Parity is absolutely amazing as well. So, yeah, I do agree with you in general. I think uh, European companies are generally very uh, careful and maybe simpler, but yeah, they, they do things slowly. <laughs> There's no rush to do things. Uh, they are not, you know, dying. Uh, to produce something like yesterday <laughs> uh, but but yeah I mean as a software engineer I guess I guess you need to think about those things a little more if, if you understand why we do what we do I think it'll be fine I think overall there's still like lack of really good engineers and if you do things uh, you know deeply <laughs> if you if you if you like love what you're doing. I think if you just keep trying, at yeah. some point your luck will change. And yeah. I actually, I mean, I remember. You know, this is maybe a bit unfair, but it is kind of true that most recruiters look at the tag. You know, like I remember, uh, I was not a computer science engineer. My first company might not be the best company to work for, and. It was very hard for me to apply for uh, companies and get an interview, you know, first. And I was I was doing this like coding, competitive coding to land some interviews. And that's how I, I was able to get interviews just by, you know, having some, there was this website, Hacker Earth, which is like a competitive coding, but you, get into the top uh, five percentile or something and then you land a interview with company and that's how i that was the only way for me to get interviews at good companies from my background with you know some college which is not very popular but once you made it to a company that that tag attaches to you and then every recruiter floods you with messages so yeah, it's a little bit of struggle, but yeah, if, if you are dedicated enough, I think you can crack it. Yeah, I definitely agree that if you work in certain companies, you're going to get much more attention, you know. And one thing that is important for everybody to understand is you don't need to be the best. Just just need to be 5% better than the other guys, you know, and you're going to be yeah. out. And, and also about interviews. It's also very much about how you sell yourself. Uh, that has been changing a lot, especially in blockchain. The process are super hard now. You have four or five interviews. 
um, I wanted to talk about, bro, um, people, they don't realize, because we're talking about jobs and everything, how hard it is to hire for a tree, first thing. Second thing, they don't realize how hard it is to, to hire for Rust, Web3. Uh, so they don't realize how, how possible, uh, the possibility of actually getting a job at Parity, you know? You just need to go, participate on the forum, show some interest, maybe do a little bit of, you know, open source work for two or three months. Can we talk a little bit about how approachable and how asset, asset, accessible Parity is to new developers? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, actually, I'm a good person to talk. If if I can get hired, maybe everyone can get hired, to be honest. Uh, because, you know, my background was completely Web2. Uh, I, I did Rust. And I didn't do Rust at all before 2022. Um, but in 2022, I just decided I just want to learn Rust, nothing else. And I was... Uh, actually also created or you know started like a trust learning group and then we were a few guys internationally in some sort uh trying to learn as much trust as we can uh yeah to your question how hard it or how approachable it parity is i was uh, i was interested in web3 as a web2 engineer and i was knocking some doors i was getting you know silence everywhere and i think web3 is also a little bit uh similar or exaggerated to the case i said yesterday like they all waiting for a tag once a company tag or some profile gets attached to you recruiters flood you but before that you just keep knocking and nobody responds to you so it's very very important to find any project, anything to do, to keep, put in your profile, you know, like on your GitHub, do any Rust uh, coding, build a bot, you know, Discord has this uh, uh, framework, APIs uh, in Rust that you can use, the Rust SDK to build a Discord bot. I actually did build one Discord bot uh, to just learn Rust. Uh, yeah, just find any job, it doesn't matter in the beginning. Uh, do it for free. Try to learn, uh, get into some blockchain community uh, on their Discord. See how you can help. Read their code. Fix few bugs. For Parity, also, if you go to Parity uh, substrate uh, issues, I think they have more than thousand issues. And of course, most of them are very hard to understand as a newcomer. What how you can achieve that, and that is where Parity actually can do better. But if you if you can go and find some issues to solve, uh, keep poking people to review your code. I think I think that's that's how you make yourself approachable. If if you are just asking to get an interview, I think yeah, it's very hard. But if you if you can do something, anything, you know, with Rust, with Web three, prove yourself a little bit. Uh, Maybe also annoy people a little bit by poking them. Yeah, at some point you will get something, and yeah, just once you get the finger, just uh, yes, take the whole hand. <laughs> uh, awesome, yeah. bro. Can we talk a little bit about Rust? So, how do you relate to the language? Do you like it? How hard is to learn it? How's been your progress since we last saw each other? Well, let's dive a little bit in your experience with Rust. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I I was doing Golang before Rust. I was doing Java and then I was doing Golang and then then I started doing Rust. And I liked it. Uh, it was really cool. And I mean, of course, there's a bit of steep learning curve, but it was a fun program. Fun language and it was also very you know like there's a saying in rust that once it compiles it runs so <laughs> as a developer you're fighting with the compiler but but once it's done you really feel like hopefully at least you will not have any memory bugs or a lot of bugs that with other programming languages you can have and i also felt like that but <laughs> then uh 
I'm doing another project, something of my side project uh, with Golang. And once I went back a little with Golang, I realized how true this is. Yeah, sorry, I thought you left, somebody left. Uh, I realized how true this is. So going back to Golang, I realized how easy it is to make a mistake with any other pro programming language. So to me, I love Rust. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's at the level of C, C++. It's, it's very performant. It has very less, like almost zero abstraction to the machine level code. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, but it's memory safe. That's, yeah, it's one of the <laughs> so, coolest yeah. language, uh, not for no reason, you know? So after learning so, Rust, you start to see the problems you may introduce with other programming languages. You know, I need to take my time and, and dive into this thing because, you know, everybody keeps talking about it. You gotta be good, you know? Um, bro, now I want to talk a little bit about Polkadot and a lot of our researchers here are EVM researchers, but I really love the DOT project and I really would like to see more things happening over the Polkadot side. So can you explain for people that are technical, the main difference is between an Ethereum node, so running some Git client and having a, and so having the layer, layer zero and all the parachains. Um, and maybe let's talk a little bit about XCM, how that enables cross-chain communication. And let's talk a little bit about framing, you know. Let's dive a little bit of how Polkadot works on a technical level. Crazy question. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I'm not an expert at Ethereum at all. I'm not an expert at Polkadot also, to be honest, but I know Polkadot a lot more than Ethereum. Um, where do I start? Um, yeah, Ethereum is, you know, Ethereum, it's, a uh, we call it layer one, right? And it's a node, uh, it's a blockchain, which has its own set of validators who are securing the blockchain. And then it has its own smart contract. and uh, yeah that that stays there forever uh, polka dot is totally different polka dot is i mean the aim or the vision actually is for polka dot is to be uh, to have not no transaction at all at the relay chain layer so when i say polka dot i'm going to mean the relay chain layer and relay chain the only uh, thing that it wants to do is provide security to all the chains that you know is uh, running on top of it like uh, yeah like any parachain that you know so the idea is if you want to run your blockchain it's it's a lot of work to find your own validators uh, good validators get so much stake uh, so that your blockchain is secure enough. What if you just inherit security from a chain which is which has already like really high security? Um, Can I make a question here? Um, yes. So I have actually two questions. One, who runs the relayer chain? Who runs the relay chain? Yeah, because it's got to be run there. Yeah, it's got to be some server running it, right? You mean like validators? Yeah. Who's running? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's running the layer mm -hmm. chain, the layer zero? Mm -hmm. Right. So there are validators, a uh, set of nodes basically distributed uh, who are running this code piece of. Like, so, yeah, I mean, that's the validators. short answer. That... Okay, validators. So we have validators instead of yeah. nodes, right? And they run the layer zero. Now, the other question that I have for you is. Okay, so those validate, when we say shared security, we're talking about all the transactions being processed 
and let's say all the Merkle trees being calculated and proved at the layer zero, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we have shared security between our chains because everybody's going to the same source to get the information, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just asking, you know. Okay, keep on. So, okay, I understood. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's true, and a lot of people think it's like then centralized because Polkadot, uh, the relay chain, needs to, you know, chain. Uh, everything is a black, is a black box. Any parallel chain uh, gives it some data to verify, like. So there are validators who are nodes who are securing the relay chain, but then there are also collators, which are uh, like validators, but uh, we call it collators for parachain. And they build some blocks and then they send it to the validator node to commit it for them. But, uh, but they send this, you know, just some bunch of bytes Polkadot cannot make sense of it. And also a parachain has already given the relay chain some function, we call it PVF, uh, which, which relay chain knows it takes that function, it takes the data that collectors gave, it tries to uh, basically run that function with that data and get some output to realize if this block is valid or not. So that's what that's all the legend is doing. It's black box, it's a bunch of bytes for them. They don't know what exactly is happening on the parachain. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense actually, bro. And I'm really amazed by it. Um, because uh, I mean this fan would be the next, you know, the next uh, uh revolution in the in the way we do blockchain today. Unfortunately, I guess the market is very greedy and is not really evaluating the options or we may have a business problem here also could be the case um, uh, and bro uh, i want to give because you know we come from humble beginnings and a lot of people you know this is being recorded so this could be here to maybe 10 20 years from now by someone and what kind of message will you give someone that is hearing this and is like completely lost, wants to be a developer, wants to get a job, but also feel like this is impossible, like uh, I'll never get to that level, you know? Yeah, I, I think it can be very overwhelming, <laughs> Web3, but yeah, as much as you feel despair, I think it's important to understand that you know, Web3 is still very, very new, very nascent. We are trying to solve a lot of very interesting problems. You know, we are trying to create bridge as we go on it. So actually nobody is an expert or maybe let's say not nobody, but very few people are understand everything about blockchain. You know, I, I understand some parts of it. I'm just filling in the gaps for other, but, so in a way, it's very easy also to come and become an expert in this industry. And as overwhelming as it is, if you can just break down and have smaller goals, like your first goal should be, you know, uh, let's just write one smart contract, whatever it is, you know, let's do a uni swap uh, again by myself, or let's just uh, see how pallet works. Let's write some code in pallet maybe like make small goals for yourself, uh, do something, interact, understand what kind of value a blockchain is trying to add or a smart contract. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just keep going until you make it. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's very, really, it's, it's- Just keep trying. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's extremely new, I mean, in all honesty, I would have not made it if if this is if this universe was more mature. You know, it's 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 still very early. Uh, we have still very few use cases that you know is like real life problems to solve to the blockchain. Yeah. So we are still very very early technologically. Uh, 
yeah, it's it's Very good interesting. engineering problems. I used to say people when you know we people start shilling about this or that technology. I mean, I love both a lot, of course, and there are good things, there are bad things, but yeah, it's amazing engineering problems to solve. <laughs> yeah, and that that gets me excited. So yeah, yeah. just do something. And you can also make a lot of money. I see so many really talented people come. And there's one big problem with Indian people. They seem to be quite insecure. At least the ones I had, I came in contact through the group. So they are always, you know, these guys, they are fucking amazing. They are fucking, you know, really smart. They know so much about, in our case here, security. They are much better than me. And they are like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if this is the way. And I don't know if this is a cultural thing or, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm maybe being short-sighted and generalizing. Uh, what is your view on that? Yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I feel there are two types of people, you know, like there are some people who are, who don't know as much, but they, <laughs> they speak a lot. They talk a lot. <laughs> and, uh, like I have met a lot of people who I got inspired by. And then I know them more and then I realize they don't know as much as they claim to know. But then there are other people who, who are brilliant, but they always underestimate themselves. So I don't know. I'm, I have met too many Indians. So I don't know if this is a cultural or if maybe it's on a, in some ways uh, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's a bit of imposter syndrome, right? And I think it's it's also that there are a lot of loud people who say a lot and it seems from outside that they know a lot. But you know, we 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 all know nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, we all are like just a little less wrong than the other, you know, like we all just learning and it's always a five percent uh, gap. It's never it's never a thirty yeah. percent gap. That is a five percent gap. Yeah, yeah. It's just fake it till make it kind of thing. Maybe it's okay. Maybe to feel imposter, uh, feel like an imposter, and actually you should put yourself in uncomfortable position to grow. Right? Uh, at parity, I feel like an imposter all the time because there are so brilliant people. So everyone's so passionate about doing what they are doing. You know, they all care about something. Uh, so yeah, just keep going keep don't let it drown you just keep improving it's a great thing if you're feeling uncomfortable you know enjoy that feeling bro uh i'm gonna ask one more question then i'm gonna open for questions guys think on the question that you guys want to make bro my question is regarding security when you're gonna join the ethereum security gang we need you bro the ethereum security too smart you know we could making up could be making a lot of money on code for arena right now you know you, you know i think i think there's more need of security in polka god in some ways i mean there's not many people yet <laughs> have so you tried of... some security some dot security some smart contract security on dot um i wouldn't say like nothing very uh professional or anything i yeah, I mean, as part of writing my palettes, uh, you have to think about these things because, yeah, <laughs> you interact with a lot of auditors, uh, making sure your code is uh, is not going to get hacked, you know? So Awesome. From the other side, not from the auditor's side. <laughs> yeah, so I get it, I get it. Side, yeah. yeah, you should come, you know, because there's a lot of money to be made here. And also, you can make in both ends. You can make a material and make a polka dot. So, for you, is actually the best possible scenario. Guys, anyone has a question to Kodeis? <laughs> Somebody I... asked, there's a relay chain layer, but hopefully I answered. Or... Yeah, let me see. I'm not, I'm not looking at the text box. Uh... What is a relay chain? Okay, so can you explain that to, to Halitus, please? Yeah, it's actually a good question. And what I understand is, so the question is basically about uh, 
are blockchain networks going to be risk with quantum computers? And it can be, to be honest. Most of the cryptography that we use are not uh, safe from quantum computers. Um, but it's it's a tricky thing to do. So, you know, like we already say blockchains are complicated and we don't want to, we want to make it easier, not more complicated or faster, not slower, right? There is some trade-off here. You can try to create a user chain. I mean, there are already uh, cryptographies which are apparently quantum safe, uh, but then it will be slower, you know? <laughs> uh and as if you are building your own blockchain you need to find a trade off somewhere where you say i think this is secure enough for today uh or for or for some long term like maybe not forever but at let's say for next 10 years i think this is safe uh but but it's also not too slow for lot of real use cases to be built on that chain right like if your chain takes 10 minutes to build a block that's that's gonna be bad right so yeah it's a very interesting question i i don't know to be honest uh i would just say that uh yeah if if there are quantum computers and there might be you know with us government and <laughs> stuff uh we just don't know and yeah, we a lot of lot of blockchains today are at risk with quantum computers, and I'm sure I, I don't know anything personally, but I'm sure there are there must be other some blockchains trying to be quantum safe out there. Mm. Good question, though, really good question. Uh, and I was just thinking about this: like, can we merge uh, some biometric ver verification with this, like uh, a private key? and with some biometric like thumbprint or iris scanning yeah i think <laughs> i don't know i mean so the problem with uh using any <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's a very hard one i'm sure it's worth a try <laughs> but so the problem with doing anything on blockchain is you want something deterministic you want the same result every single time and you don't want it to be crackable like nobody else should be able to figure out your private key from just looking at the pattern of your transactions right if you can somehow achieve both of them maybe it's possible but i don't know i mean uh, i don't know how a biometric hardware will work in a deterministic way you can maybe fake it or yeah how do you make sure every every single node is not malicious you know that that part i'm i'm not sure how it it i don't think it can work because of that like anybody can say like you have to trust that every validator is executing the same code right and if somebody's being malicious, you need to figure that out and punish them so they don't do that. Uh, I think this would be easy to fake if you have some kind of dependency on like a biometric hardware or iris scanner. But what do I know? You know, I should try. <laughs> Very interesting question, though. Uh... You have any yeah. idea? I would like to see also your view on the AI thing after Chat GPT. You know, we didn't have that as a PBA. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting. And I think I'm already using Copilot a lot. And it actually helps a lot with, uh, you know, writing boilerplate code today. <laughs> uh, not really, it, it, it cannot think of subtle things, but I think it helps. With documentation a lot, uh, with with just things that you will go and copy paste from somewhere, I think there it, it's gonna help a lot. I have seen on like something that I really like about a uh, lot of code help features from AI is if you have like a pull request, it like Copilot can actually figure out or 
make some suggestions on the PR already, you know, some security issues and stuff like that, which you might have missed. So those are incredible. And I think it will just go better and better. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was the question, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I do think like AI is going to be, yeah, AI is going to be like a really cool help as a programmer, you know, it, it's like an evolution. You, you wrote code on some plain editor, then, then you started using, uh, you know, it's VS code or some you know, nice ID, which helps you with a lot of things. Now you might have an AI, which also helps you write code faster and for you to become more productive. So yeah, it's, it's exciting, <laughs> exciting times. Bro, thank you so much for coming here today. That was a really good talk. Um, so nice. I uh, really like to have you here more and you know, dropping us some polka dot alpha, some substrate stuff, you know. Uh, so if you have the time, please, you know, hang by 10 minutes a week with us. It would be really cool. Thank you so much, man. Uh, any closing thoughts? You want any things you want to say? I guess, I guess no closing thoughts from our friend Codace. And this is it, bro.